Lord, we've already heard from you this morning, and we want to continue hearing from you. Inspire us, Father, by your Spirit. Change our thinking by your Spirit. Change our lives as we listen to your word. In the name of Jesus, amen. Good morning, fellow Corinthians. See, I'm going to keep going on until we get... For those who don't understand that still, where have you been for the last two weeks? Um, We're going through the letter of 1 Corinthians, and we acknowledge that actually the city of Corinth, its lifestyle, its cosmopolitanness, See, I make up new words as I go along. Uh, It's a a mix of different religions. It's craving for status. It's craving of self-subsession, self-promotion. It's craving for greed and sexual immorality. It ain't no different from today. So we're Corinthians, or we live in Corinth, at least, in one form or another. So welcome to you. So... Uh, I'm going to have to say this right from the off, um, and I'm expecting zero sympathy. Um, I had, a couple of days ago, uh, a tooth out. Yeah, if that was sincere, that would have been nice. Um, no, I'm joking. I, in some, some regards, it was. Um, and so, I've got to say, I'm in, in a slight amount of pain, so that when you are weak, I am strong, is ringing through my head like it's going out of fashion. But do bear with me, because quite frankly, I'd rather not, and this has got to be a miracle, and joy is praising God, I really don't want to open my mouth much at the moment. Um, But of course, in the next 55 minutes, I'm going to have to keep talking. I can stop, that's fine. But I choose not to. So, So just bear with me if you suddenly see me go, ouch, or ah. But hopefully I shouldn't do. I got prayed for earlier that I'd have the adrenaline to keep going. So what have we learned so far in this letter of Corinthians? We've actually now finally gone through the whole of chapter one. It only took two Sundays. Don't panic, only another 15, I think, to go, if my memory serves me correctly. So what is the key message that we are trying to learn? Well, there's, there's a number, but there's one I want to, I'm trying to get us to run through all the way through this letter from beginning to end. So what is it? Does anybody know? Don't be shy. Okay. I heard somebody whisper it, I think. My tooth is gone, not my ear. We are God's own possession. Hallelujah! We are God's own possession. Shout it out next time, Subana. We are God's own possession. We are sanctified. This comes from chapter 1, verse 2. It is present tense. You are sanctified. And we we basically spent the most of this morning actually singing that or singing it in a mime. We are sanctified. So we're God's own possession. Yes? But we're still not quite getting that embedded. The fact there was a lot of... (laughs) Yeah, tell me about it. We are, you're right. So sometimes there's a lot of that. We haven't quite got that to the point where we can shout it from the rooftops, yes? So we're going to keep banging on about it until you get it. There is an old uh, adage that does the rounds within uh, the ministerial sort of network that we probably think it's just a nice uh, parable rather than reality. But a new minister came along to a church and for one Sunday after another Sunday after another Sunday kept preaching the same sermon on the same passage over and over and over again. Eventually, the leadership team, the deacons, took him to one side. No, it's not about me. The leadership team, the deacons, took him to one side and said, you know, we really are very unhappy with this. You keep talking about this same message, this same sermon every Sunday. It's good, but it's the same one every time. And he turned around to them and he said, have you got it yet? And they said, no. He said, until the church gets it, I'll keep preaching it. So if you could turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, I'm joking. (laughs) 
Also, uh, we looked at the tail end of chapter one, the fact that uh, there was a real problem within the Corinthian church, that they were arguing over which leader to follow. They've clearly picked up something from the city, the city they're in, and were worrying about whether they should be following Apollos or Paul or um, Peter, uh, Cephas. Or some were saying, we only follow Christ. Well, actually, those that say they only follow Christ are not acknowledging the authority of the leaders in the church. Are actually, quite frankly, out of the four, they're the worst bunch. But... Um, we just picked up that as well. There was a lack of acceptance of the authority of the church leaders. So, we are going to continue into chapter 2, 1 to 5. And you may not remember, but I actually plowed through uh, the last few verses of chapter 1, saying it sort of gets summarized in chapter 2, 1 to 5. And here goes the summary. So, look, we're still on the screen. When I first came to you, dear brothers and sisters, I didn't use lofty words and impressive wisdom to tell you God's secret plan. For I decided that while I was with you, I would forget everything except Jesus Christ, the one who was crucified. I came to you in weakness, timid and trembling. And my, pre my message and my preaching were very plain. Rather than using clever and persuasive persuasive speeches, I relied only on the power of the Holy Spirit. I did this so that you would trust not in human wisdom, but in the power of God. Well, what's Paul saying? First and foremost, let's re-remind ourselves, as I said earlier on, that uh, Corinth, the city, were very impressed with eloquent speakers who expounded marvellous words, and they sounded beautiful, technical, full of deep, rich meaning. They loved people who sounded good. And the problem was, they were so impressed with this. As, do you remember I said that people almost flocked to hear a really good speaker? They would pay good money to hear a good speaker. Speaking about whatever they wanted, whatever philosophy they wished to portray, whatever worldview, talking about whatever God they followed or anything they particularly learnt. And people would love to hear knowledge and soak it up. And they really wanted to enjoy that presence. I mean, even got to the point where these uh, impressive speakers would, you know, in a, in a meal, would suddenly get themselves encroached into a house, speak for a while, and of course then people would talk about how great they are, and then they would uh, pay money to hear them again. So that was their, their way of being. The problem was Corinth had really picked up on this. The, the, sorry, the church had really picked up on this. And, and sort of almost translated what happened on the outside, for want of better phrasing, and we're bringing it, that view into the church context. There's almost a sense for me, though, in the city of Corinth, these people with eloquent phrases and wonderful words that could speak marvellous, supercalifragilisticexpialidocious-type words and sound wonderful. There'd be people going, oh, yes, mm, mm, thinking they actually understand what they're really meaning, but they probably don't, but they don't want to look stupid. So probably a chunk of the city were probably a bit daft, really, because they weren't willing to acknowledge that maybe they don't understand what's being said. It's like the old children's story, The Emperor's Clothes. Know that one? Where supposedly the emperor gets conned by some con artists about that they can use invisible thread that's only invisible to him, but everybody else will see it. And eventually the emperor goes, makes him this glorious uh, 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 outfit. He goes in into town uh, with his glory, but naked, as naked as the day he was born. And uh, he, everybody else, all his advisors and everything, says, oh, yes, it looks marvellous, it's wonderful, etc. thinking that they're stupid. Because what it said was, only those who are smart can actually see the cloth. Anybody who's daft and stupid can't see it. So you can imagine that sort of imagery. And of course, eventually it takes a little child to go, he's naked. And then everybody realises actually they've all been very, very daft. I can imagine that somewhere in Corinth, that sometimes you do hear something and you might go, oh, yes, yes, thinking, I haven't got a clue what they've just said. 
You might walk out of here this morning thinking that as well. I might walk out of here this morning going, what did I say? But they were loved, eloquent speakers. So Paul is accused by some of the church of not being one of these wonderful, eloquent speaking. Didn't have great ability. And actually, they then class that as maybe that Paul might lack some intelligence as well. Wasn't very clever. Didn't have a lot of wisdom. Now, actually, there's a difference between being intelligent and wisdom, by the way. You can be incredibly intelligent, but if you don't imply what you'll learn, you're not using a lot of wisdom. You've heard the phrase some some people, they're really intelligent but got no common sense. They're the person who uses a screwdriver to hammer in a nail. Excuse me if I've just insulted anybody whatsoever. Doesn't mean you're not clever and you're not wise in other areas. But they liked this whole view and so therefore then thought Paul, because he wasn't particularly flareful in his speech, didn't quite have the uh, the presence that the intelligence in Corinth had, the impressive speakers. And Paul is saying in here, you're right, I didn't use lofty words. I haven't used impressive speech because, quite frankly, to tell you God's plan, I use very plain words, very simple. I basically forgot everything I knew and I spoke about Jesus Christ or Christ crucified saying I didn't bother using argumentative wisdom to portray the message I just said Christ crucified and we'll come to in a minute what that took place in but just think for a moment for yourself if you find yourself in a debate with somebody about Jesus and God and this um People sometimes say, well, I can't believe in this all-loving God you talk about when there is sickness, evil in the world. And you try and defend God, don't you? I know I used to. You should try to defend him. Oh, goodness me, he's God. Um, and, you know, let's try and defend him. And actually God's saying, well, no, I don't want you to use impressive wisdom. I don't want you to do that. Just talk about what Jesus did. Your relationship that's the gospel. And I said this last time we spoke, that actually you don't need to be impressive in intelligence, a great deep theologian, know how to do great apologetics, as the technical term is called. Just talk about your own relationship with him. That's enough. That's enough. You don't need any more. So... For Paul, he's just saying, well, that's all I ever used. The impressive speakers would elevate themselves with lofty words. I can imagine. I mean, I can't use big words. And if I do, I always get it wrong. I always put it in the wrong context with the wrong definition. So I don't. Or I try my best not to. Paul says, ah, but I'm elevating Christ with my plain words. The impressive speakers speak about themselves. He speaks about Christ. Remember I said this is a summoning up almost. And if you look at uh, chapter 1, verse 31, it says, if you want to boast, boast only about the Lord. The impressive speakers in Corinth will talk about what they're going to do and how marvellous they are. You know? This is what we're going to do if we're elected in May. That seems to be doing the rounds on the news at the moment, doesn't it? And Paul is saying in the verse one that he, I didn't use lofty words and impressive wisdom to tell you God's secret plan. What's the secret plan? Christ, the revelation of Christ. It is nothing else. That's all the secret plan is. But the Corinthian church seems to be accusing them of being almost constantly repetitive. Christ crucified. Christ crucified. So all Paul seemed to talk about was Christ crucified. Christ crucified. Christ crucified. Christ was crucified. Crucified was Christ. Christ crucified. Does it get boring after a while? But until you get it, 
Do you understand what it means for you? You're going to hear the same thing. Christ crucified. Christ crucified for me, us, you, we. Christ crucified. And that's all he must have done half the time, was just talk about for 18 months while he was with them, Christ crucified. It must have sounded seriously boring. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter verse 1. It must have sounded boring. When he'd done pastoral work with them, half the time he must have just talked about Christ crucified. Got a problem? Look to the cross. Suffering from sexual immorality? Look to the cross. Suffering from the pangs of greed? Look to the cross. Got a problem in your life? Look to the cross. Could you imagine anybody want to come meet Pastor or me and all I keep saying to you is Christ crucified. Christ crucified. But actually, that's the underlying... You might well say, be quiet, please, Warren, saying Chris. She didn't quite say, use those words, but we'll, we'll be polite for the camera. Um, but, the, the <laughs> but we will talk about that and then we will go... But the underlying pin of every pastoral conversation I ever have is Christ crucified. That's the answer. That's the ultimate answer. What Christ did on the cross is the ultimate answer for your problems, the world's problems, and the whole of creation's problems. Now, you do need to live that out, work that out, talk that through, and because then how does that apply to my current situation? Could you make it a bit more practical? But Paul must have just been absolutely boring, or so they thought. Because all he would say is, Christ crucified. And he would repeat the same message. Question for you, who are you? Say that out, somebody just said it. God's own possession. You still haven't got it when you get that question being asked, have you? Okay. We'll keep going on the same message. Should be instant reaction. Who are you? God's own possession. Okay. We're getting there. But Paul must have been seriously boring when he just kept saying, look to the cross. And so he's being accused of not being eloquent of speech and marvellous and wonderful. But Paul is saying... I forgot what I intelligent. Please remember this, by the way, that Paul was literally the intelli most intelligent, deep theologian of his time. Educated under Gamil, would have been probably the next high priest within the Jewish order. And this is the man they're saying, you ain't got a lot of wisdom, you're not very intelligent, because all you seem to talk about is Christ crucified. This is Paul. And he's saying, yes, and I did this all in with timidi timidity and trembling. Talked to nothing but Christ crucified. I came to him weakness, timid and trembling. Now, this could have mean two things. Paul himself is not particularly a confident chap when he is speaking publicly. This also, which it would make sense of the way that the Corinthians have clearly had a go at him in some form or another. But this could also mean that he's saying, I came to you with fear and trembling, i.e. a healthy fear of the Lord. I came to you weak so that Christ is strong in me. I came to you with a sense of fear and trembling because I needed to rely upon the Lord. Are you with me? It's like me, tooth out. I've come here with a slight trembling mainly because of the painkillers. But I've come here in weakness this morning because it's really hurting. And Paul is saying, I actually wish to use the power of the Spirit rather than my own intelligence. And my message was, and my preaching was very plain. Rather than using clever and persuasive speeches, I relied only on the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, when we read those words, power, we start thinking, miracles? Yeah? You think Paul's, ah, oh, done some healing. Did some preaching and then did some healing. We see that in Jesus' ministry. He preached the word and then backed it up with power. 
This is not what Paul is saying. He's talking purely about the power of the Spirit to convict people, even if his speech was not very good. Even if he fumbled over his words, said it in the wrong context, he relied upon the power of the Holy Spirit to touch people's lives. And that would make sense because in chapter 1, verses 22 to 23, he said, It is foolish to the Jews who ask from signs from heaven. This Christ crucified is foolish. Jews ask for signs from heaven. Well, if they're asking to back, it, back up what he's saying, and he clearly didn't use them, they would keep asking, wouldn't they? Because if he did show some signs of power, see healing, somebody raised from the dead, you know, minor things like that. It was a joke. Try and be with me so far. Um, but if, you know, use those signs, then there'd be no argument from the Jews, would there? But Jews are still clearly very unhappy with the Christian message that's come from Paul. So he didn't use healing. He used the fumbling of his own words. And God, via the power of the Holy Spirit, touched people's lives. And that's what he means. So maybe for yourself, as I said, I come back to this fact. If you're talking to somebody about Jesus, you think, oh, I don't know how to put this together. When I start talking, I fumble over my words. I may not be able to string two words together properly. And is this going to make sense? Am I saying the right thing? The power of the Holy Spirit will talk to the other person, even through your weakness. Going back to that lady who left that message on the office answer phone today. One piece of paper on a windscreen. Don't seem much, does it? But look at the power it had on her life yesterday. If you could hear the message, you'd be going, wow. She was really lifted up. She was at a low point, she said. And it lifted her up. Doesn't take much. The Holy Spirit does the work. Paul is no used car salesman, clearly. Used car, a good used car salesman knows how to sell you a car even if you don't want it. Yeah? Check this out. Cherry red. You want cherry red. No, I know you want silver. No, you want cherry red. These are not just seats. These are grey velour seats. Yeah, I'm going back a few years. Yes, this is ABS. No, I don't understand what it means, but I know you know what it says. No, it's not anti-braking system. That would be dangerous. It's anti-lock braking system. But you would have that, and a used car salesman can do that. Would almost sell you a car that you don't want. Sorry, I'm just having a flashback memory. No, this is... Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> my soul is redeemed. I'm okay. Um, <laughs> It wasn't a bad thing. I, I was not a dishonest one, I'm glad to say. I was a Christian at the time. Um, that's just threw me. That's right, that whole mess of memories just threw me completely. <laughs> we'll move on. But it was the power of the Spirit that Paul used to allow to convict people. He didn't need to convince anyone. He would just go, Christ crucified. And rely upon Christ to help him. Now, verse 5. I did this so you would not trust in human wisdom, but in the power of God. He said, I dumped what I knew so it would rely upon the Holy Spirit so that you wouldn't trust in me like the city does, trust in the impressive speakers, the politicians of their day, but you would trust in the power of God. Don't forget, this is on the backdrop of him having a go at them, that they keep going on about which human leader they wish to follow. Say, no, I didn't come to you with all this. I would go on about Christ crucified because that's who I want you to point you to. Now, we're not saying that Paul literally took what he did know and just go and leave that to one side. Because he knew tons. He didn't just throw away wisdom 
and the intelligence that he had, he actually probably used more wisdom than anybody else because he said, here, I just need to talk about Christ crucified. What he's battling here is what's going on out in the outer city, which is now infiltrating the church. This elitism, this idea that if it sounds good out there, it needs to be here in the church as well. And he's battling that, saying, no, don't get caught up in all of that, the show and the pomp. Because that's what it is. The impressive speakers use great words to convince you. And he's saying, don't get involved in that. It's not that, because if you do that, you nullify the power of Christ. If anybody wants to convince you to do something, they use fantastic words, like I use for the used car salesman. No, these are not just grey seats. They're grey velour seats. Velour, by the way, in its day was like the material to have on a seat. Today it's not like that. It's leather. And you go, wow. And if you try and ignore the imitation leather, they'll still throw in leather for good measure. Or it used to be, these are sort of plastic coated. Don't worry about when you're hot and your skin sticks to them, but they're lovely. But you notice the words. You always add in a nice descriptional word and you go, oh, that sounds good. And Paul is saying, no, that's outside influence coming into the church. Stop. That's the wisdom of the outside that is doing that. The Corinthian church was running itself and its ideas in how to live the godly life based on the wisdom of the city. Must have done. If they wanted Paul to be impressive, they wanted him to also be like the city speakers and tell them what they wanted to hear. Now here's a question for you. Has it infiltrated the church what goes on in our city today. There was a time, and it still is occasionally a time, that it is good that we pick up something that's going on out in the world and we go, oh, we should have caught up with that. Like, for instance, the world is not flat. It is round. If it wasn't for science, we would actually wouldn't discover the fact that the planet doesn't sit on four pillars, as the church would have you convinced. And lots of other things. But then there is some views on how we should live our lives. Are no longer what I would consider non, are no longer biblical. They've actually come from the world rather than from what the Bible says. And unfortunately it infiltrates the church after a while. It starts infiltrating the God-given message that actually is being spoken at the front or in house groups. I'm not saying this happens in these house groups, I hasten to add. But I'm just saying. I hear it around, we see it on the news, and this is okay now because we're in a different world and a different culture. No, it's not. It is not okay. This is why I noted the fact that we are like the Corinthians. If Paul speaks against something that's going on in Corinth, it equally applies to us today. We haven't been enlightened especially, my brothers and sisters, have we? Certain things still hold true whether we like it or not. We'll come back to that at another time. But Paul is just saying, you have got caught up. By him tackling and saying he's true of he using plain speech, you have got caught up in the world's way of being. I want to read the whole of uh, the, from verse six down to the end of two now to us, and I'm going to summarise into that. Remember, he's being accused of not being very mature. In his walk. Yet, when I'm among mature believers, I do speak with words of wisdom, but not the kind of wisdom that belongs to this world or to the rulers of this world who are soon forgotten. No, the wisdom we speak of is the mystery of God, his plan that was previously hidden, even though he made it for our ultimate glory before the world began. 
But the rulers of this world have not understood it. If they had, they would not have crucified our glorious Lord. That is what the scriptures mean when they say, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. But it was to us that God revealed these things by his spirit, for his spirit searches out everything and shows us God's deep secrets. No one can know a person's thoughts except that person's own spirit, and no one can know God's thoughts except God's own spirit. And we have not received God, sorry, and we have received God's spirit, not the world's spirit. So we can know the wonderful things God has freely given us. When we tell you these things, we do not use words that come from human wisdom. Instead, we speak words given to us by the spirit, using the spirit's words to explain spiritual truths. But people who aren't spiritual can't receive these truths from God's spirit. It all sounds foolish to them and they can't understand it. For only those who are spiritual can understand what the spirit means. Those who are spiritual can evaluate all things, but they themselves cannot be evaluated by others. For who can know the Lord's thoughts? Who knows enough to teach him? But we understand these things, for we have the mind of Christ. It's at that point I go, Paul, what are you going on about? Anybody with me? Good. Amen. See, I like some honesty. See, he's naked. If you remember right from the beginning of this letter, I spoke about the fact that it wasn't just about church unity, but Paul had a much bigger view involved. A big word with a lovely big word that I can never pronounce. Eschologic. See, there you go. End times, basically. The end rewrites the things. Yeah, it's no good. I, I've practiced it for five times this morning. Estetocologic. I can spell it. E S. <laughs> See, I'm not an impressive speaker. But Paul is saying that the wisdom of this world, that the world throws out there, is absolutely no good whatsoever. It doesn't speak properly into times of today. And he's going on about spiritual maturity, etc. The three key words in that for me are wisdom, maturity, and spiritual. In that whole passage, he is talking that those who are mature in Christ have the wisdom of Christ, and those who have the wisdom, therefore, they must be spiritually mature as well. So at that point, I then read this and think, okay, if I've not understood the passage, I can't be very, very mature then. But it's not about that. Do you remember I said there's a difference between knowing something and living it out? The difference between being intelligent and wisdom? And this is the case here that partly Paul is going on about. He's saying the, in, the rulers of this world, which is a phrase that he uses, is, could mean both humans and the demonic, by the way. Sometimes we like to just take that up as being demonic. And it's not. Sometimes it means human rulers are well. And what he's saying is that their wisdom is not godly. It actually opposes God. So therefore then, they make claims about today's situations through human wisdom, which is not of God. God has a much bigger view. Let's put it a bit more practical, shall we? Let's take illness. Tough times. Good times. Let's take death, shall we? The world likes to contribute its meaning into these things, doesn't it? The worldly wisdom likes to give you a view on maybe sickness or death. In the West, there appears to be a vague understanding that there's roughly a right time to die. You'll know it when somebody maybe who was slightly elderly, say, you know, sort of reached their 80s, late 80s, early 90s, and they die. The good phrase, oh, they've had a good innings, haven't they? Are you with me? Hear that phrase? Heard that phrase? There seems to be in this West, this right time, roughly, to die. 
all to be ill. I remember when I got rheumatoid arthritis in my early 30s. I had people come out, you're a bit young for that, aren't you? Bless you. Not bless you as in that I've got it, but in fact they thought I looked younger than I really was. That was really nice of them. But there seemed to be roughly the right time to get certain major illnesses, apparently, in our society today. In some other cultures, depending on the age of the person at death, might define the mood of the funeral. Too young, it's incredibly sorrowful, at roughly the right age, and there's a sense of celebration. Tough times. In the West, there seems to be this, that's so unfair, that shouldn't happen to you. Or we might go, this shouldn't be happening to me now. Life was just going so well. I've been a good person. Vaguely. I was a used car salesman for a while, but I was a good person. There seems to be that. Our worldly wisdom seems to have this thing that there's certain right times for certain things to happen. Yes? And you hear it all the time. And Paul is saying... That's from the outside. And unfortunately, that does come into the church. And Paul is saying, no, 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 no. no. God has a bigger view on your life. There is a, that bad word I can't pronounce very well right now. Do you know it's going to come to me? No problem later on in the office. But there is an end result to your life. There is a future hope that goes beyond your present situation. And I'm not denying that when we're going through the tough times and when we're going through troubles, we shall float along. It's okay. I have hope in Christ. Everything's fine. Because if that's true, I wouldn't be banging on about my tooth all morning, would I? And there are people here in church who have gone going through a lot worse than I'm going through. But we shouldn't float about it. But what we should do is take that situation, whatever it is, health, job, family, right, rift, or whatever it is, relational problems, take that in the light of the bigger picture. Not listen to what the world says, which says, oh, it shouldn't really be happening to you right now, that. And this is what Paul is having a go at. He's saying, listen, you might get it out there, this wisdom, but that's not what's going on here. Prime example he uses for that is in verse 8. Which, if you give me a moment, or the computer a moment, we'll get there. But the rulers of this world have not understood God's wisdom. If they had, they would not have crucified our glorious Lord. Now, sometimes you can read that and think what that means is, if they understood that Jesus was God's son and was the Messiah, they wouldn't have crucified him. They would have embraced him and taken hold of him and loved him. That's not what it's saying. The rulers of this world knew by crucifying Christ that they would have lost the war. Then they wouldn't have crucified him. When Christ was crucified, he won and beaten death, hadn't he? So if he'd won and beaten death, he's stolen it away from the rulers of this world, be it human or demonic. If they'd known by crucifying him on the cross that they would have lost the war, they wouldn't have done it. Where they thought they were gaining victory, they didn't realise they were handing victory over to God. Get the point? And the wisdom of this world says, when you've got an enemy who's going to undermine you and take away your power, kill him. That's the wisdom of this world. Jesus, please do not get me wrong, he really, just beyond being the son of God and it all being predestined and preordained, he was actually undermining the religious rulers of the day. He was swiping away their power. He was getting followers following him. They really weren't liking it. That's the only reason they got him crucified. Had nothing to do with God and them thinking, oh, they're doing Yahweh's job they nicely overshadowed that with nice flowery words this is the this is the lord's work we need to get rid of this man for the lord load of baloney 
It's because he's removing their power. So the way the world's wisdom to deal with that is kill him. But if they'd known by killing him, they just lost the whole battle, they wouldn't have done it. This is what God says, is, uh, Paul is going on about, that worldly wisdom does you no good. What looks like logical, correct, may be the right answer to a problem that you've got in your life, may not be from God. It's the world's way of dealing with something. God has something else bigger in mind. This is what the scriptures mean. Now, uh, Paul is not quite, I think, in verse 9, quoting directly from the Old Testament. There is some views on this that he used the procedure that is quite right, that sometimes you took an Old Testament verse and you might well have um, changed it slightly, uh, which is okay to fit what you're writing. It's almost like when you write an essay sometimes. You sometimes put in, you shorten, take out certain words because it doesn't grammatically flow properly in your, uh, in your speech. And you put your three little dots in or your little brackets. I remember those so well from college. Um, But he's saying here that actually the more important for me that no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. Question, do you know what God has got prepared for you? Do you know what God has got prepared for you? And at that point, I bet a good three quarters of us have all gone... Not in my immediate situation, no. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Or this year. But remember, this is a bigger view. What has God got prepared for you? Hmm? Heaven. Heaven. An eternity of in his presence. That's quite big. Have you got that? Do you understand that? Please pick up just for a minute. Have you, do you know what God has got prepared for you? Yeah, it's what he says in his word. Eternity with him. Now, if you get that up here and you understand that, what does that mean then for your life and how you live it out? Remember, there's a difference between knowing something and the wisdom of living it out. Thank you, Wendy. Yeah, gives you strength and patience knowing where you're going to spend your end life. With me? So I don't know what you've got going on today or what's going on rattling around in the back of your brain. There was, um, when we were singing that song earlier on, Jesus is alive, yeah? Yeah. I almost want us just to keep repeating that like a mantra until we actually got it. And then we started realizing, understanding that Jesus is alive. Amen? Amen. Jesus is alive. Amen. Jesus is alive. Thank you. And when you get that point that Jesus is alive and you make that part of your, your life, then you know what he's got prepared for you. Yeah, we don't know what heaven looks like. And, you know, there's a whole load of things behind that about whether you spend eternity in heaven or spend eternity on the new earth in a new resurrection body and all that stuff. But whatever it is, it's eternity in the presence of our God. Amen? Amen. So when you realize that and you start living that out, it makes your current situation look like nothing. The wisdom of this world says nothing bad should happen to you. Baloney! Of course it's going to happen to you because we live in a fallen world. It's mainly fallen due to the worldly wisdom. There's a catch-22 for you. All the problems we have today is because the world's wisdom says we have these problems. So why would we want to drag that wisdom into the church? into the life of Christ. We wouldn't, would we? 
So chuck it out, says Paul. Says Pastor Warren to Greenford Baptist Church. Chuck it out. Pastor Warren says to himself in the mirror most mornings. And this is where he's saying, you think you're mature. Now we'll come to that in a moment. In that verse 16, he says, we have the mind of Christ. He's not saying they understand Christ's mind. They've got like a direct link in. They've actually got Christ's mind. What they're saying is we're living out the wisdom, what Christ did in our life today. Because we're listening to Christ. Those of us who are maturely spiritual are picking up on this. And there's a lot more to say in that. But again, as I said, Corinthians, Paul almost seems to have to repeat it through the letter at various points to re-emphasize things so people get it. So I'm not going to pick up everything that's in these verses because we will pick it up as we go through the letter. So, last lot, chapter 3, verses 1 to... Dear brothers and sisters, when I was with you, I couldn't talk to you as I would to spiritual people. This is where Paul's now given a mild admonition. He's having a go at them. I had to talk as though you belonged to this world or as though you were infants in the Christian life. I had to feed you with milk, not with solid food, because you weren't ready for anything stronger. And you still aren't ready. For you are still controlled by your sinful nature. You are jealous of one another and quarrel with each other. Doesn't that prove that you are controlled by your sinful nature? Aren't you living like people of the world? For one of you says, I am a follower of Paul. And another says, I follow Apollos. Aren't you acting just like the people of the world? Paul, earlier on, makes a distinction between non-Christians and Christians. But here he actually makes a third category now that slips in between the two. Those who do belong to Christ, because he says, dear brothers and sisters. He's not excluding the Corinthian church. He's saying you still belong to Christ. But what he is saying, that you are clearly no longer, you are not mature enough yet. I had to give you milk because you couldn't cope with solid food. When they're talking, they're saying, you need to give us more information, Paul. You need to sound better. He's saying, well, I can't. You're still babies. And this is about four years on since he was last there. Four years when he first entered there. This is four years on this letter. You still want milk like a baby. You haven't got your teeth yet. Oh, I know how that feels now. Just remember me, so. You still want, you still need milk. Why? Because you're still quarreling. You're still worrying about what leaders to follow. You're still after sexual immorality. You're still greedy. You're still following the ways of this city. You're not mature yet. There's quarreling among you. You're like babies. Big, big babies. What does a baby normally do? Demand everything. Feed me. Milk. Change my nappy. And most of us go, yeah, okay. No, I don't want to go to sleep right now. You're tired. I don't care. I wish a baby would respond like that. But they wail and cry and moan and don't really communicate, do they? They are babies. They're immature. They don't understand. They haven't got a clue. And Paul is saying, Corinthian church, you're no different from babies. You're banging and whining on, and you expect me to talk to you maturely like you're adults. I can't. Why there is still faction, why you're still causing relational difficulties, why you're still divided, you're babies. You're there on your back with your legs in your air and your arms in your air and your little clenchy fist going, wah, 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 wah. Goodness me, he's, I can imagine Paul's really frustrated. And the problem is you're banging on because... Um, you keep going on about the same stuff. The mo- Notice this, they're having a go at Paul about quoting the same thing, Christ crucified, yet they're doing the same stuff over and over and over again. So they're no different from what they're telling, accusing Paul of being. And he's saying, get over it. There is selfish ambition amongst you. We know that from earlier on, and we'll look at that in chapter 11 when we go to Corinthians later on. 
There was selfish ambition amongst them. That's why there was an argument over communion. Who could take it and who couldn't? Paul is saying you do not have the mind of Christ because of your division, because of your sexual morality. You keep crying on about it. You're no different from the outside world. Where is your Christ-like mind? So coming back to our situations today, if we take up the wisdom of the world and get knocked and collapsed at every moment that something bad happens, how are we going to be any different from the outside world? I know a story of someone, of a Christian, who in their department, the entire department were being made redundant. They all got letters. Everybody else was running around like a headless chicken, crying, what am I going to do next? What are we going to do next? What are we going to do next? They were the only person who wasn't. They were calm as whatever. Somebody eventually came up to them and said, come on, aren't you worried? Aren't you concerned? I went, no, my God is bigger than this. Paul is saying, while you're still whining like babies, you're not giving thanks to God for what you have so far. You're just like acting like people out in the world. What Paul is basically saying right from the beginning, chapter 1, verse 2, when he confirmed their status as God's own possession, sanctified. He's saying, but you need to live in that light. That is true wisdom. That is true wisdom. Who are you? Third sermon on it. We're doing well. But the issue is the wisdom that we use... We should use God's in light of the fact that we are God's own possession. The way we tackle situations and problems should be done using God's wisdom. Now notice that we bit. That we bit says that we should do it together, not as an A individual. We're not lone wolves, my brothers and sisters. We're a church, we're a body. We are to do it together. So we're meant to go and see one or two other people maybe and say, look, I've got this real, I have no idea. Could you pray this along with me, please? Could you hear for me, please? If your spouse is, if you're married, and it's a situation that's affecting both of you and you want to hear from God, I would always suggest go and find other people to talk to as well. Because sometimes when we're so wrapped up as spouses in what we think we want, we actually listen to each, we tell each other what the other person wants to hear, rather maybe than what God is wanting to say. You with me? You want to keep the peace. Or you may not want to keep the peace. Go and talk to other people. Get them to pray along with you and listen to God for you. It is a we. This is what he's going on about in here. Don't forget, he is still trying to unify the church. So we do it together amen Amen. and we listen to God's wisdom together amen Amen. let's pray Lord I just think that we have the privilege through grace to have the wisdom of God that same wisdom that created the universe That same wisdom that can apply order into the chaos that maybe is our lives today. Father, I want to pray for each and every one of us that we walk out of here knowing that we are your own possession and knowing that we can use your wisdom in all of our situations. I pray, Lord, through my plain words, your spirit will touch each and every one of us. In the name of Jesus. Amen. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. 
To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.